Okay, thanks. Um, let's uh, deal with the uh, what was done a session two, uh, changing households, uh, and was actually session three. Sorry, my ability to count sometimes goes down when I'm uh, um, a little bit sleep deprived. So the purpose of this session is really to pick up from the previous ones and to think about um, what we know about households and uh, what we know about households and surveys uh, in particular and how that uh, uh, affects our understanding of what's happening in national surveys. So the, that's the breakdown of who's going to be talking in this, uh, this session. So the turns out that I'm going to be impersonating quite a lot of people here, uh, in case you're wondering. Uh, okay, so the first person I'm impersonating is Mark. He was online a couple of seconds ago. So if you're there, hi, Mark. Uh, I hope I did do you proud. Um, so um, uh, Mark, unfortunately, is traveling in a couple of moments uh, on Saprin business. So uh, he was initially going to dial in, but uh, that's uh, uh, impossible. So, so he's the co-director of um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, SAPRIN, which stands for the South African Population Research Infrastructure Network. Uh, it's uh, uh, the national link-up of all of the health and demographic surveillance uh, sites. Uh, he was based uh, um, for many years in the Agincourt uh, Health and Demographic Surveillance Site. He's still uh, based there some of the time uh, and has an appointment in the School of Public Health at the University of Advertisement. Uh, so in the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s, uh, we had the uh, HIV um, uh, epidemic, which uh, very rapidly led uh, led to a lot of deaths, particularly of prime age uh, individuals, and there was a lot of speculation in the late nineties about what this would do to households. Uh, so people were talking about this cataclysmic breakdown of the social fabric that was going to occur uh, as uh, people in the prime age years would dying off. Uh, and of course, they were dying. So we don't want to minimize the, uh, uh, the, the impact uh, and the damage that uh, epidemic uh, did. But uh, the one thing I think we can all agree on, it did not lead to the disintegration of households in the way that, that people um, uh, thought it might. I started talking to Mark uh, in about 2000, and we started looking at this using the data from the Asian Court Health and Demographic Surveillance Site. So another round number, lots of round numbers. Um, um, uh, the Asian Court data spans 30 years. So the site was set up 30 years ago, uh, which is why they've got that nice little logo with the 30 on that. Um, uh, and has been collecting yeah, uh, information on a sort of harmonized way, it's consistent basis uh, for those 30 years. So it's located in a former homeland next to the Kruger Park uh, uh, and uh, has been collecting census level information. So births, deaths, in migrations and out migrations uh, since that time period. So this is uh, the study site. Um, uh, the original villages are in the southern part uh, of, uh, of that shaded area. It was enlarged, the site was enlarged in the mid-2000s uh, to, yeah, to, to a bunch of extra villages. The, uh, the northern parts uh, are slightly more uh, peri-urban, uh, the, the southern parts are more deeply rural. So there are now 31 villages that are in the site uh, and they're collecting uh, information on about 120,000 people in 21,000 uh, households. So uh, when we were working on the Agincourt database, uh, 
The household was defined by resource sharing. So it's the, what we call the common pot definition of households, which is common pretty much in all household surveys around the world. And of course, uh, a location component. So you had to be a bunch of people co-resident in a space uh, sharing uh, resources. But in the Agincourt site, unlike in a lot of our national surveys, the households were defined more flexibly. So they could keep absent migrants on the household uh, roster uh, if that migrant was expected to return. You know? So sometimes that was uncertain to the households. Is this person going to come back or not? Um, uh, but, uh, but basically, they're, they're on the roster until the household has decided they've actually gone for good. Um, uh, and a lot of people uh, do circular migration. So, um, so that still uh, is a feature in all of the rural areas. Uh, and uh, uh, it didn't end uh, with the end of apartheid and uh, uh, the end of uh, uh, the, the, the sort of hostile system uh, on the mines. Households are also captured by a relationship to a head. So a head is identified in each household, uh, and we get full set of relationships of every person to that head. Those obviously change whenever a head dies and you get a new set of household uh, relationships. Now, because we were thinking about, you know, what's happening to households, we didn't want to say, well, it's now a new household just because the head has died. So the thought experiment is if it's a granny who dies, everybody else is still there in the same compound, in the same place. And all that's happened is that her eldest son becomes the new head. In some ways, it's still the same households to us, at least conceptually speaking, kind of like. So, uh, so we defined a household um, as basically a bunch of households as defined uh, in the Agincourt database uh, in a place uh, sharing resources. But over time, it's the same household if the membership overlaps, kind of like. So if there's still people from the previous household there in the same place, then now the bridge eff effectively, we stitch together households like that over time. So that's a particular way of thinking about a uh, 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 household and longitudinal dimension there. There are other ways of doing that, but we did that because that was what we could do on the, uh, on the, uh, on the data set. But once you've got a longitudinal sense of what a household is, uh, you can actually then say, well, you know, how, how have these households changed over time? Uh, and we want to explicitly look at transitions between different types of households um, the, the sort of panel uh, analysis. The results of this were reported in 2007 uh, in a special edition of the Scandinavian Journal of Public Health that was dealing with the Agincourt uh, uh, demographic site. Uh, but that way in which we constructed the households, uh, Mark and me, um, uh, is now actually embedded in the, uh, in the Agincourt definition of a sort of longitudinal household is actually in the Saprin uh, uh, data. So we had a bunch of research questions. So, so the one uh, which was actually sparked by the national data, uh, which we'll talk about um, uh, in, in the next uh, presentation, is was there really a big increase in the prevalence of single person households? So it turned out, and we called it in uh, paper, an explosion of solitary living in the national surveys, a big, big, big increase in the late 90s. And uh, we were skeptical, but uh, we wanted to understand, did that really happen? And uh, the spoiler alert on the right hand side, there's no evidence of this explosion in solitary living in the Agincourt data. And actually, we don't think it happened nationally either. Uh, in the Agincourt data, in fact, uh, there was a slight decrease in the proportion of single person households in that seven year period that we were able to investigate 96 to 2003. Second question, uh, were the big multi-generational households breaking up under the impact of the pandemic? Uh, 
turned out no, actually they've seemed to become even more common than before. And we didn't investigate this thing, but probably because they were picking up orphans, you know, so basically the orphans weren't being left in these kid only households, which the newspapers got very het up about, they got moved in into bigger uh, other households. There was another part of the national literature uh, uh, in sociology that basically after the end of apartheid households were becoming more westernized by that it was meant they're becoming more like the classic nuclear family husband wife and x number of kids uh, uh, so was this true uh, and spoiler alert, no actually uh, we didn't see more nuclear households in the Agincourt area uh, and in fact, the, new, the proportion of nuclear house is also decreasing in that period that we were looking at. Um, the AIDS story was all about these non-standard households, these child-headed households, households of only siblings left because uh, the adults had gone. Um, so were we finding any sibling only households? No, we didn't find them. In fact, they were extremely rare. So this is now an update. So there are cruder version of graphs in the 2007 paper, but since we have many more years of Agincourt data, I decided to pull this uh, just before, um, uh, yeah, this, this workshop. Uh, so this has not been published anywhere, uh, but the trends actually held up remarkably well. So we were right, we called it early, but, but actually in the Agincourt stuff, it's right. So the uh, the uh, left-hand panel, if you look at the number of single-person households, well, that's actually remarkably stable. There's definitely no big increase in single-person households uh, in, in this rural areas, maybe uptick towards the end. Nuclear households, that's the sort of maroon dashed line, major drop actually over this period. Uh, uh, and Whereas it, I guess I don't fully really understand that, that'd be interesting. Multi-generational households, big increase actually over the same period. And we had a category called complex households. So these are basically households in which they're typically in-laws. So it's not just like a sort of standard, you know, kind of like descendants of, of one matriarch, uh, but these are people where there's also kind of like, you know, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, father-in-law, mother-in-law, and on top of kind of like, you know, the, the, uh, the head. That's also becoming a little bit more, became a little bit more uh, um, uh, common, although it tailed off towards the end. And then the right-hand panel, uh, note that the scale is very different. These are very rare households, typically, kind of like, so basically, there's only to 4% of uh, households. Uh, so couples, yeah, they bounce around, but but no big trend there. The skip generations, so this is basically, this is the granny with the grandchildren, no intervening generation whatsoever. That We expected that to become more common over the pandemic, but you know, those are actually still very rare, not even you know, one and a one percent maybe of all households fall into that pattern. And the category of the weird and wonderful siblings only and any number of these, less than 1% and actually decreasing over time. So that, that's the, um, uh, the takeaway. So multi-generational households, more common. Uh, these complex households, more common. But at the same time, what's weird is that the households are actually shrinking, which is kind of like, so basically they're becoming more complicated, but smaller. I mean, that is something that I guess uh, uh, is a little bit unexpected that we showed in other work. Um, so Agincourt households have lost basically one member on average over this period. That's actually a big, big decrease. It's the blue line going, going down. And that um, is harder to cross check against national data. So nationally, we know the average size, household size has come down, but to have a comparable uh, series you want the rural households rather than than all households uh, and it turns out that we're missing a big chunk in the middle because the rural indicator disappeared in the uh, 
uh, StatsSA uh, surveys. The NIDS data on household size is weird, it, depending on whether you take all residents. Uh, this is just the, up to 2012, which is the comparison. Uh, it bounces around in ways that uh, are a little bit uh, disconcerting, but we'll have a, a closer look at some of that uh, uh, later on. So Asian Court gives us a very clear signal. The national data also shows decreases, but it, it's a kind of like a slightly messier uh, pattern. So we use the Asian Court data to check what's kind of happening you know, how did this household size reduction occur? And um, uh, it turned out that most of the change happens at the point uh, when households dissolve. So basically, typically that's in this case linked to a migration event, they move off somewhere. And then by the time that they settle somewhere else and reform, they're actually smaller. So they seem to slough off people in that process. Uh, somehow. Uh, we showed uh, in a very recent paper, although again the first draft of that paper goes back also to 2006, <laughs> uh, that uh, part of the change we're seeing in Asian Court is that people seem to be moving from the remote villages to more centrally located ones which are better serviced. And in fact, uh, the Asian Court site had a bunch of RDP villages uh, um, uh, created, which um, seems to have led to excess new household uh, formation. So here's the picture for the excess household formation. Uh, the, so, uh, the vertical lines are at the places where a new RDP village came online. And we suddenly see, um, a lot of new household formation, that's the top line. Uh, also increase in some dissolving households, so basically internal migration in the area. Uh, but the, uh, the net uh, household um, um, new formation spiked around the time of the first big RDP project. And how did that happen? Well, you could think that maybe pent up demand for separate accommodation. So basically maybe uh, there's development controls in the rural areas. You couldn't just build under the apartheid system. So maybe as that um, disintegrated and as people were given free houses, you have this unmet demand suddenly creating this new house information. There's a suspicion that a lot of it was bogus the household splitting each other and putting in some people into the village. So you keep your ancestral home, but you also have a free home in the village. Now that we can't, that's a suspicion. That's kind of like anecdotal evidence. That's not a real evidence. But looking at the, the, the information we had on our database, it, um, it seems that it's a, uh, Combination of both probably uh, is the is the thing, and then the question, of course, which is to get back to the data quality issues: to what extent can you then just differentiate in the data real household new formation from bogus household new formation? The short answer is you probably can't. So the big lessons from that Agent Court research is really that cross-checking different types of data is helpful. Uh, Looking at only one data set is probably, yeah, never, well, often it's, it's useful, but, but if you're looking at trends, particularly looking at the same thing from different angles helps. Household definitions matter. So the definitions matter both for the migrants, kind of like, you know, do you count them? What I didn't point out, of course, is that the Asian Court definition gives you much bigger households than you get in the rural things, even in NIDS, which has a slightly more generous definition of household membership. Um, and um, it certainly matters when you're thinking about, you know, what happens uh, when people occupy RDP housing. Uh, and how and why people live together is a, is, a, is a big question that we really need to understand uh, better um, if we want to get uh, meaningful measures of these households in our surveys. Uh, so 
And uh, yeah, we don't pay enough attention to that. Yeah, I'm very angry to talk about the national story. Okay, I again. Um, so I'm going to talk about the national story. Okay, hi again. Not the last time you're going to see me either. Um, but I'll only be impersonating myself, not anyone else. Um, so this work came out of Palms, which was Takwanisa was the first person to mention it here. Um, and but this is about about household formation. I'm not pretending to be a demographer at all. Um, so it, it came about thinking about how the sampling methods that were used um, created some of these strange things that Martin said were going on in the national um, national surveys. And so this little uh, yellow box shows a very big decline uh, in the third of, of a person between 98 and 2000. Uh, so that's just a very short amount of time. But actually, in the previous row, so that's over here, so people who can are in person, it actually drops quite a lot between 97 and 98. Um, so the first one is about hostels not being counted in OHS 96 and 7. Uh, lots of um, political violence going on and status say not wanting to go to those areas. Um, it also means that mining employment is much reduced in those two surveys also. Um, and so that led to when hostels were then properly covered in 98, um, uh, a decline that was a result of better coverage rather than um, uh, actually being uh, households being smaller. And then this um, changes in, in sampling uh, methods and field work is responsible for that difference between 98 and 2000. And Martin and I wrote um, an article about that in developing Southern Africa. So just pointing out some things that will come later, the percentage of dwelling units with more than one household reported is two in 1995. So that's um, multiple people or multiple households being present at the same physical site, usually a backyard uh, dwelling, um, maybe more recently on an RDP uh, stand that's become extremely common, um, but or potentially several households all sharing. And what stats they say thought was a dwelling unit, a visiting point, one place where they expected to find one household. Um, and this, the last column is extremely dramatic, you know, the, the, the share of households that are enumerated at these multiple household dwelling units goes from like two or one percent to 16, uh, 17 percent um, very quickly. So there was this massive change in, in how Statsisa was, was doing the sampling. Um, partly this came about because of the master sample in 1999 that had multiple impacts on, uh, on various parts of the surveys. Um, but Statisa would reuse the same clusters, small uh, PSUs or numerator areas um, for interviewing people uh, across different surveys. And um, you really don't want to then be, if you don't want to substitute a household that doesn't respond by going and knocking on somebody else's door if that household is actually supposed to be surveyed in two or three years time. Um, so Statisa changed from no substitution, sorry, from substitution you go to a household, you knock on the door, they say they don't want to speak to you. In OHS up to 1998, they would then uh, ask the field worker to substitute a different household. And that then changed in, uh, in 1999. So that was the one big thing. And then going back to small households, um, if an enumerator found a small household before 1999, they were supposed to pick one only and interview um, one of those households with what Statsis A called probability proportional to size. So larger households has a, had a bigger chance of being uh, surveyed. And from 99 onwards, every household at, at the dwelling unit uh, was surveyed. So that makes uh, a difference because what Statsis A ended up doing is not adjusting uh, for this difference in probability of, of selection uh, up until, well, 1998 was the last, the last time. So one thing you can see, the, just the no, substitu no substitution on the right and the multiple households being enumerated, you get this big uh, distribution of the number of households actually interviewed uh, per uh, cluster or per EA. Um, it was 10 in pretty much all the surveys. Um, that was the, 
number of dwelling points to be visited, but you can see before 99, it's basically almost always exactly 10. Um, and then that nice, interesting distribution of number of households interviewed um, from 99 onwards. So one of the things this means is that um, 1999, pre 99, small households are missing. Um, we could potentially solve that problem if we knew all of the households that were present. We got a field worker manual. I think it's the only time I've seen a stat to say field worker manual. We managed to source one for 1996 or something like that. And there was a very clear table showing uh, the probabilities of selection of the different uh, households um, and how stats South African enumerators should choose to uh, which households to pick. If you corrected, um, for the probability of selection, you could get back the right number of small households. And what's clear in the data is that just didn't happen. So there wasn't any adjustment for the fact that small households, when they were found, had had a much smaller probability of selection and so should be uh, weighted up. And so this change is partly, well, mostly due to um, this, this, the decline in one person, a rise in one person households is, is due to mostly to this change. Um, so substitution is not so good, but also giving field workers um, control over this process of choosing one that didn't work well because it was a lot of effort to find, if you reported like to your boss that there were all these households at this dwelling point, you had to knock on each of the doors of the households and say, okay, you've got two members, you've got five members, you've got 20 members, and you've got one member, and now I've got to do this complicated formula and choose one. So it wasn't just the fact that they messed up the weights, but it was also the fact that, let me go back, uh, you're getting 2% over here, because it's super unpleasant for an enumerator then to have to, uh, to have to do all this work to figure out which of the one households they were going to pick. Um, and yeah, so that partly also explains why in the uh, previous periods, Stats say seemed to find a lot more dwelling units where there were, um, where there was more than one household. So that's a combination of field work, interesting field work, uh, thoughts, how field work um, impacts on surveys, and then also uh, the sampling and, and getting the weighting right. So we basically can't find these people, but we can never put them back. They were not found. Um, and even if you adjust for weights and Takunisa and Martin and I did some extra things on that, uh, you can't really get them back. Um, that was probably as a result of the field work. Um, yeah, so you can't do anything about sorting that out. So now I'm reporting on work that uh, I did with Tom Harris. Um, so, uh, he was uh, employed in Data First back in 2016. Um, and it really was building on that Agincourt work, which was uh, um, thinking about households as longitudinal entities, so entities over time, and thinking about what happens inside these households and what happens at the margin where households uh, dissolve uh, and, uh, and form. And the question was, could you use uh, the NIDS data to do this thing nationally? And the big problem was that NIDS, of course, is designed as a panel of individuals. So we do interview um, uh, the co-residents of every uh, continuing sample member. But even if you, have that in front of you, you then have to work out, you know, when is the household still the same household as the one that you uh, 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 as uh, in, the, in, in, in the previous wave. If somebody splits off, moves off somewhere and meets up with somebody else, is that a new household, a newly formed household? So the simplest case of that would be like if, uh, if uh, two people get married, you know, so then you Think, well, that is a newly formed household. Or is it a case of somebody just joining a pre existing household, which has always been there and in some senses uh, already accounted for in the NIDS uh, um, um, weighting schemes? So it, it's actually not, not easy to get that concept 
Right, and uh, in his uh, dissertation, uh, uh, he did a first cut at basically defining uh, this panel of households. Uh, that code of how to do that um, uh, is available on the website of demographic research, although we, uh, I still want to clean it up before uh, we release it uh, properly. So, but once you have that, you can actually then say, well, you know, what does it show about, um, you know, household size? What does it show about um, uh, electricity availability? So, um, so um, one of the things that came out of that when we started looking at that household distribution in MIDS was that it's bloody weird to put it bluntly. And it's actually not just weird, it's actually disturbingly weird. <laughs> So this is when we look at the changes over time from wave one. Uh, and what I've got in that uh, um, uh, orange box is basically what part of the overall change in household size is driven by different types of households. And the fact that uh, the biggest part is driven by one person households, means that they've become a lot more prevalent over time. So in NIDS in a way which is much bigger than, uh, than the, the corresponding figure that you'd get from the national surveys. Um, but the more disturbing thing is that two, three and four person households have actually become rarer than they should kind of like, so effectively, um, instead of them also increasing over time, which is the national pattern and contributing to the overall drop in household size, uh, they've actually become relatively rarer than they should. Um, and, um, and that change in balance is, is, you know, so if you actually look at these size distribution, which I haven't got here, uh, there's a big shift between NIDS wave one and NIDS wave two. And of course, the reason why that nobody knew about that is nobody's actually looked at the household size distribution or the household distribution for that matter um, over time. And the fundamental story is that attrition and NIDS, actually there's a big household component to that which um, uh, is not modeled uh, essentially. So many individuals are lost when the whole household moves. So basically you're losing basically clumps of people rather than them individually. And, um, uh, and uh, what that does is basically is that pretty much, and this is now mea culpa, I generated those weights. Um, the weighting adjustments we do all assume this is just individual characteristics that we see that matter. Your income, your, your, um, uh, your, um, whatever, not the household size that you are uh, part of. Although by wave five, I think Nicola fixed that because we kind of shown that, but going back, um, thinking about what that really does uh, is, uh, is one of the, uh, the issues. And that does skew the, 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 the household size distribution um, uh, when you think about household processes. More positively, uh, Tom showed that, uh, you know, whichever data sets you use, whether you use uh, uh, NIDS, uh, the national GHSs, or the Asian court data, um, uh, electricity access has increased over time, um, but in with sort of interesting dips. And the dips uh, are not just measurement things that actually there, there is a sign that, that households do actually disconnected um, in every period uh, over, uh, over time. Yeah, so I'm gonna switch from impersonating Tom to impersonating Amy. Um, and yeah, so the context of her work, uh, I've already showed the, 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 the waiting stuff, is this rapid household formation over the post-departed period. She tried to understand that, uh, bearing in mind that the national surveys have problems with capturing small households. Uh, and the weights didn't deal with these properly. Uh, 
So once you fixed up the weights, um, the research question was, you know, can we now think about what uh, uh, happens to household formation over this entire period? Uh, and can we use that information to explore the process of household formations? And that's in her uh, PhD. I'll just click on that working. Ah, there we go. So one of the questions so that she looks at specifically is uh, if we look at the time when people leave the parental household, so you can work that out from, you know, when does the status of somebody change from being son or daughter of, uh, of a head to either being the head or the spouse of the head or, uh, um, yeah, or, or some, some other relationship. And it turns out it's quite interesting. So if we look at um, uh, over the, the time period uh, and we look at different cohorts, we're going to talk more about that this afternoon. So we're looking at tracking groups of people through these surveys. You find that among Black African men, the younger cohorts, so the people who were born more recently, actually seem to be leaving the parental household faster than uh, than the older cohorts do. So the the uh, um, the maroon uh, and orange lines are on the upper side of the graph. So at each age, so at the bottom we've got the age from 15 to 35. Uh, at each age, the fraction that have left home is higher. Um, uh, for those younger cohorts than it is for the black lines and the uh, blue lines, which are the ones that were born uh, earlier. So, so that, of course, is part of what then leads to this increase in household formation is that people seem to be transiting out of the parental household uh, earlier. Less stark among the women, um, and, and certainly, uh, but, but maybe some evidence uh, there as well. Uh, we can check what does that leaving home status, what does it cor correlate with uh, on the employment side and the marriage market and the interaction of the two. So we have different lines here. So if I take the, the pattern for the men, the uh, that sort of greenish teal colored line uh, are basically men who are not married and not employed, they basically stick in the parental household for much longer. Well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, there's no, uh, they may eventually get kicked out in some cases, but, uh, but that, that, that is exactly what, what, what you would expect. Um, if you just employed, but not married, that's the black line, you exit kind of like uh, sooner. So basically, effectively, if you have the resources to set up, you, you will do so. Um, similarly, if you're unemployed but married, if you're a man, you will actually exit uh, uh, faster. Um, uh, and that, I guess, is, uh, uh, is because of the marriage status. If you are both married and employed, so you should ignore the first couple of lines because they're not many 15 years, year olds who are both married and employed. So that, so sort of artifact of maybe two people in the data sets, whatever. Uh, but you can see the very, that line is much higher uh, and way above the other. So basically that is obviously a signal for a lot of young men to, uh, yeah, to move into their own, uh, own property. For women, um, uh, the, yeah, if you're not married nor employed, you basically also stick around uh, in your, uh, in your parental household for longer. Um, but uh, young African women who are employed and not married do exit. Uh, and, uh, and that con in conjunction with, um, uh, with the fact that marriage rates are disintegrating, uh, probably not disintegrating, they're at a much lower level now than they were uh, 20 years ago. Uh, probably explains a big chunk of that increase in, in the household formation that, that, that we've seen. Uh, 
if you're not employed but you're married you're almost definitely to move out that's the uh that's the orange line and the blue line um is uh if you're both married and employed then you're also definitely no longer um uh, at home so what is the research shown uh so basically the national surveys have an issue with changes in the types of households so um and that's true across the board um fixing the weights uh, as amy did for the ghs is a useful step to getting data that allows you to think about what happens to households uh, and cross-checking with other sources of information in this case the hdss data is actually extremely useful the definitions of household membership do matter for who shows up in the surveys um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah the substantive conclusions is that living arrangements uh, probably don't fit into that neat western pattern of you know in the nuclear household um, households are getting smaller over time uh, and that at least some of that is probably interacting with uh, service delivery so basically uh, uh we're not we're dealing with a very changed uh, set of social processes These are not just um um a sort of preferences which people have inherited you know from their parents and grandparents uh um that that the context of what uh how government is uh, uh serviced sites and whatever has, has done a lot uh, also to explain it, um that so the relationship between the labor market, marriage market, and leaving home, obviously, is, a, is something that, that we want to understand if we want to understand households. Um, there's part of me that thinks that the NIDS weights do need to get redone from the bottom up. Um, although the discussion we had in the earlier sessions around the QLFS, the NIDS weights aren't exactly wrong. So they're probably still useful for most purposes um and and we hope that the the uh that the uh yeah that the things don't hinge on uh, on 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 those kind of uh issues yeah set of references which people can look at when we distribute the slides question time I think um is, is there someone okay we'll start with this online comment um so neil rankin um says that the fact that uh, we saw few changes in the asian court um is understandable because of the rural geography uh and extending this nationally uh is perhaps difficult because national data files tend to show uh, this particularly happening in urban informal areas, um, suburbs. Um, so, and these changes are of course related to definitional differences. So then the question he's asking is to what extent can the urgent court data tell us something about what is happening in the metros and the big towns? Well, the, the, there's several parts to that. So the first thing is that in the rural areas, you do find the decrease in household size in the national data sets. That's not just an Asian court uh, thing. So when I say there were problems with the national data, it was specifically that in picking up the rural sample and making sure that rural means the same thing over time is you know, is, is more complicated than in Asian court. We know we're dealing with the same area and basically changes are not going to be driven by changes in the geography or, or how rural is is captured but the rural sample nationally does pick up a drop in household size so 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 the asian court and the national data do talk to each other despite the problems with the national uh surveys but of course asian court can't talk for the metros i mean you know nobody's going to say that you're going to look at asian court to tell you what's happening in the metro so so the household story in the metros, I think, if anything, is going to be more complicated uh, than a snapshot survey is going to tell you. So now Saprin has started a process of opening up 
uh, urban nodes. Um, I think running them is going to be hell of a difficult. But basically, the what you do want is you want essentially to to be able to see how do these things pan out, you know, in a given area over time. You know, so basically, if people are shedding members. Uh, How's that happening? Is that happening because uh, people are getting kicked out of households that they were in beforehand? So uh, the households hit hard times, they've got uh, lower income. So people are saying, no, actually, we can't feed you anymore. You go and do your own stuff, you know. Uh, and there were anecdotal stories and, you know, also people getting kicked out during the AIDS pandemic because of stigma, you know, basically. So if you contracted AIDS, um, your family didn't want you there and basically uh you got told you know you're going to live, live somewhere else you know so we were half expecting that that changes within the existing household so if you literally have the same household over time that there'd be some people who'd be getting kicked out it turned out that actually very little of that seemed to be happening in asian court that the households in place stayed similar size maybe even grew and uh, a lot of this stuff happened basically when a whole household moved, kind of like, and then, at, you know, when sort of bits of it resettled in other parts, then somewhere in that process, you had uh, smaller households uh, at, at the end of it. So that, but doing that in the cities, I think is going to be much harder because there's a much mo more mobile population. So, so even these urban surveillance sites are going to have to find, you know, like if somebody just moves five kilometers down the road, but out of your sight, you're going to lose them. And, and those kind of patterns are going to be much harder to pick up. Yeah, so I think, yes, one doesn't want to say these demographic surveillance sites will be the answer to uh, understanding what happens in cities. Anthropologists can also be useful, you know, even finding a couple of cases and telling stories about it, what that happens sometimes is, is very enlightening. Um, but the point is, if you're going in with a national survey once and you're knocking on doors and, you know, and you're doing a roster, my sense is there's a floating population, people who kind of like, you know, so, uh, you know, anecdotally, it's the boyfriend of the daughter who spend some time there, but some time not there and doesn't get captured on the roster or may get captured on the roster, depending on, on what they feel like at that point in time. There was a question of uh, Diana. Uh, th uh, thank you very much for the presentation. So my question basically is, what happens when there's been an improvement of coverage? So for Kenya, for instance, maybe earlier surveys don't capture the informal sector as well as the later surveys do. So what that does, when you look at maybe the labor market in terms of the wages, you might find that the wages have shifted way to the left. So is it that really the real wages have decreased or is it that... Um, what we are seeing really is the fact that now you're capturing most people in the informal sector who perhaps don't uh, make as much money as people in the formal sector. And then the other question is still coverage. This is coming from what you talked about, about mining. So what happens when, and hostels as well, what happens like in a survey when you don't capture people who are perhaps in the army barracks? Of course, if they're not single person households, we're not worried because somehow you'll still be able to capture that. And like people who are in student residences, because I think we don't capture those two. Thanks. Sure, okay, I'll try. Um, yeah, I like the, the end part. I'll, st I'll start there because I've got probably more to say about that. I think that's who, who makes it into the uh, target population is important to, to think about. Um, I've been doing work with Nicola on student funding and trying to use the GHS to, to do that. 
and it turns out we're missing, there's a lot of students missing. Um, in fact, even more than would be expected if you figure out how many students are in res and stats say on purpose chooses not to not to sample from residences and, and other places. Old age homes are, are, are another one. Um, so yeah, um, I, I guess that's just to emphasize maybe something you already said, which is that that really matters. And again, there's no way that weights or you know something else is going to solve the problem that there are no literally zero uh, university students in residence captured in South African household surveys. So that's you just got to say, well, that's something that I can't investigate. Or if I do, I've got a very selected type of of sample. I'm I'm missing some students and and others I have, and they're not they're not random. Um, the informal employment. Um, and earnings, yeah, I mean, that's, it's great that, that you're aware of that. Again, I don't think there's necessarily a solution. Um, yeah, I, and, and that came out in the, I didn't mention this, but that came out in the OHS thing as well. So single person households are much more likely to have that one person employed. Uh, so the rates of employment are much higher. And that meant that around that time, there was also a big increase in, in employment that was partially driven by the fact that you were capturing types of households that were more likely to have employment than, than others. So, yeah, and, and it's, it, it's great that you're aware of it for the particular surveys and country that you're interested in. I don't, I don't know that there's necessarily a, a quick fix solution to that problem. Yeah, we don't have the answers uh, to all the problems. Uh, often we have problems to answers that you already thought you had. Uh, and and that seems to be our particular niche is like, you know, kind of making people depressed about their data. Um, no, actually, we still believe that at the end of the day, you want to know about these things and that even when you can't fix it, at least if you're aware of it, uh, you're going to be producing better quality analyses uh, than, than if you just kind of close your eyes and hope for the best. Any other questions? <laughs>